So Simon Napier Bell, first of all, it's absolutely wonderful to see you again. That lovely smiling face, those memories of drinking at the Reaper Barn, <laughs> all flooding back. Um, first of all, I really want to say I watched the George Michael portrait of an artist and it's so emotionally moving and revealing. It's just a wonderful uh, work of art. I mean, it really we, is I, we had fantastic. We had great reaction. I'm, I'm very flattered by the reaction, but it was a very difficult film to do because um, it, it, it's not just because it's George, almost nearly, nearly all great artists plumb the depths sometimes in their life and then they get in a bad way. And you have to think, if you're going to make a, a film about an artist, you need to show the downside and their mental disturbances. But if it's not related to their art, do you need to, you know? And um, so I felt that what we need to do was take him right through his life, show, if you like, the decline at the end, but only where it related to songs, which is why we have songs coming up all the time, to show what he was, how he was performing or what he was singing at each time. Um, and then a lot of people said when we were editing it, oh, you've got to show, because we, we got a lot of stuff on tape we didn't show, uh, who people knew the details and nasty things about the end of his life. And I said, they're not relevant. There's nasty things in everybody's life. We're making a film here. Really, it wasn't about George Michael. The original title was The Artist Versus the Music Business Versus Himself. I'm going to cut you off there because we're going to talk in depth about George Michael a bit later. And because you said that it was the artist versus himself, you know, going in, in depth about their life, I really want to start by talking and getting a portrait of you um in your life and um and i start with all my interviews talking about childhood and people growing up and what their parents were like and whether they were culturally interested in any way so what was your childhood like <laughs> i should have get, sent you a copy a preview copy of my new book which is coming out in october which is the first time i've written a book which isn't really about music business it's about me uh with quite a bit of music business but it is it includes a lot about my childhood um so my childhood, well, first of all, um, I don't think I was loved or unloved. And I, 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 I think if you're happy with yourself, you've got to be happy with everything that happened in your life because that's created what you are, even what seemed to be bad things at the time. And um, my parents were both people who hadn't had parents. So my father's uh, father had died when he was very young and his mother wasn't, knew nothing about bringing up a child and sent him off to boarding school and the holidays. She paid other pupils to take him for the holidays. So he never saw his mother. His father had died. My mother's parents both died in the flu epidemic when she was seven years old, brought up by great aunts. They didn't know about being parents. They were, tried to be good parents, they were, were good parents, but there wasn't a lot of love and affection and they didn't know how to deal with it. Now, I love that. And you know, I was incredibly free. When I was seven year old, so old they bought me a bicycle and I could go up my bike at weekends after breakfast, so 8.39 in the morning, if I was back by six in the evening, um, there was no... Now, seven years old, seven years old now, you, your child is out of sight. The parents get taken off to prison or something. Um, by the time I was 10, I was cycling. I mean, there was a, I cycled all the way to Oxford. I, I, I worked out I could cycle. I had from nine o'clock to six o'clock, so I had nine hours. So I could cycle four hours in one direction, eat my sandwich, which I'd taken with me in cycle for us back in but after three years I'd done everywhere around London which is four hours away and I had decided about going to Oxford so I cycled to Oxford one day and I arrived at 4 30 in the afternoon I had to be back in London at six so I went into the police station I was very cute eight year nine year old boy and I said I've been a very naughty boy I said um my, my mummy lets me go out all day and I meant to come back out and I've come too far and I'm going to get into terrible trouble and the policeman, well, I was a very cute, nice kid, and quite articulate. And the policeman took pity on me. He said, well, my mate's about to drive down to London. He said, um, he could get you back home in time. So his policeman drove me back to London and stopped at the end of the road so the police, my mother wouldn't see the police car. I mean, nowadays he'd go to jail too. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> 
What about culturally? Because your father. Well, my was dad a... was my dad was a film director, so you know um, we, we were middle class cultured. Uh, he was a documentary film director, not a feature film director, but that that brought me up. I mean, I, I was working with him on location when I was seven or eight years old. You know, getting the tea actually, but you know, I, I learned all about filmmaking, um, and he passionate about films, took to the National Film Theatre every weekend, and um, and sort of highfalutin arty stuff he liked and got me trained in it. And um, culturally, my mother wasn't, no, my mother was not very cultural at all. She, she read books, but there were only, you know, sort of um, page turners and uh, not into music. My mother, our father was tremendous into music and films. What uh, sort so of music was, did he listen to? Well, of course, there were 12 inch LPs. He'd buy Beethoven's symphonies and there'd be eight different LPs. Incredible how he listened in those days. We didn't mind a sudden break at a peak of some piece of classical work. Um, and I wasn't very into that, but I was very familiar with that booming out of the sitting room where he'd be sitting uh, and I'd be doing something else. You know, so I like, I guess, popular music. But I, that's before I was 10. When I, when I was 10 years old, um, popular music became the worst it has ever been in the whole history of popular music. Um, things like How Much Is That Doggy in the Window and, and Shrimp Boats. So these were terrible songs the corniest it's ever been, and I couldn't stand it. And I, I, but I love music, so I hit upon trad jazz and uh, fell in love with jazz, completely in love with jazz. And I, I, I was given a trumpet for Christmas, learned to play the trumpet. When I went to school, I, I formed a jazz band, and that was my ambition. I was going to be a great jazz musician. I was going to be a great black jazz musician. That's what I remember. I definitely, that had to be part of it. And when I was 18, I left school and went to America as a musician. Uh, but I soon found out I wasn't all that good and I certainly wasn't going to be black um, and sort of gave up on the whole thing. It was eight hours a day. Well, I had to practice four or five hours a day. I wasn't a natural trumpet player, so there's a lot of practice involved. Well, I earned my living for, it for two years. Um, but what was interesting is when I had to earn my living from it, I had to play in a band in a dockside tavern uh, where we played pop songs. And I hadn't listened to a pop songs since those awful songs when I was 10 years old. So I had to listen to the current songs and they were fantastic. I completely changed my mind. I suddenly realized that pop is the real art because by then the top 10 songs were things, Frank Sinatra can fly with me or Bobby Darren, or, you know, or Fats Domino. These were wonderful pieces of music that that pappy period had gone away completely and pop had become really refined and artistic. So at that stage, I fell in love with pop music for a while and drifted off away from jazz. Um, but books mainly is what I, what I was involved in because I, I gave up the trumpet. It was too much work. So how, how, I, come, how come you became a songwriter then? Where did that sort of step come in? Well, I, I, I gave up trumpet playing. and I, I had to have some objective and I decided I'd hitchhike around America. I'd go to it. I hitchhiked to every state. And I did that for a year. I got to every state, I think, because in those days, Hawaii wasn't a state. So you could, could hitchhike to every state. And... Um, and I read books the whole time. You know, I stand by the edge of the, or sit by the edge of the road reading a book. And sometimes people would stop for me and I'd ignore the lift because I was in a good place in the book. And I would go away. You know, I'm just reading this last chapter. So. Um, and um, so that was, that was pretty fascinating. And I, I was very into modern, you know, into the uh, American beat generation. I was reading things like John Recchi and passionately in love with that sort of gay underground literature of, of the uh, early 60s. And then I... I had to do something, so I came back to England and I couldn't hit China in America for the rest of my life. And, um, and I fell into the film industry because my dad being a director, I, I managed to get into the union and, and get a job as an assistant editor. So I got in the bottom end of the film industry. Um, but I, I was quite good and I was an assistant editor and I knew music, I could read and write music. So an opportunity came along and I was promoted to music editor and that was a well-paid job. And I did... Um, I, I got put onto a film called What's New Pussycat, Burt Bacharach was the composer. And, and he'd, never, he'd never composed a score before. So although he'd had all these wonderful number ones with Dion Warwick, he was contracted to write a film where he'd never written one before. And, um, and the, he recorded all his music. I mean, you know, in a film there are 50 or 50, this one has 52 music sections, 52 little places where music comes. And you know, a film score is one magnificent theme and it repeats and maybe a second theme somewhere, you know, people like Maurice Shark, you know, absolutely classified what the mode it should be. And Bert had never done a film before. So he wrote 52 tunes 
And it was terrible. It wasn't a score. He had one great song, What's Deep Pussycat, and 51 other tunes, which sort of, you didn't get a score. You didn't get a feeling of cohesion. And the producer had signed a contract with him, which said it had to use Burt's music, but they couldn't ditch him. They couldn't get rid of him. So he flew out to America and they called me in to the office and said, look, you know, could you make a score out of this? Were you imagine I was 25, I was being given Burt Bacharach's music. I was told I could, I could score the film with his music. So I spent six weeks in the cutting room. I even had a bed in the cutting room because it was absolutely 24 hours a day. And um, took his best bits of music and threw out all the others and then made a score, I edited it all together. So that really um, did two things. One is it taught me that I loved playing with music. I didn't particularly like playing the trumpet. I'd realized, but I did love playing with music. And the other is it made me a lot of money because the way that film uh, editors or editors got paid is you were paid, you were paid for eight hours. And if you went to overtime, you got time and a half. And if you went to after midnight, that would be double time till eight in the morning. And if by any chance you went on again at eight in the morning for another eight hours, you got double, double time. But I had a bed in the cutting room and I stayed there for six weeks. So I ended up on 25 times time. So um, I left that cutting room with the film finished and was given something like 15,000 pounds, which is like getting 200,000 pounds now. Absolutely incredible amount of money. Um, and I thought, well, from now on, I'll do what I want to do. And I was going to clubs. I bought a flashy car um, and fell in with people in the music business. And I thought, this is what, this is what I'll do. Because I used to go to these clubs and at two o'clock, I said, I've got to go now. I've, I've got to be up. I've got to be in the cutting room today to the morning. And they say, oh, we're staying. And I said, well, how can you stay? What work do you do? And they said, oh, we're in the music business. And I thought, bloody hell, if the music business means you can stay up all night, I think that's what I'll do. So bit by bit, I went to the music business. And that, then I met people and, and we started doing other things like writing songs. I mean, the, the, the obvious famous one is You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Um, but those, that song is from the original. I've got to look at this. Loce non vivo senza te. I who do not live in brackets without you. And you obviously rewrote in a sense, or, or I don't know what it was. It was very interesting because um, I sensed at once that the meaning didn't matter. The feeling matters. And if you try to translate a foreign song word for word, meaning wise, you'll miss the feeling. You know, the feeling is what you're trying to get. And, um, and I, this was with Vicky Wickham, who, who I've become great, great friends with this. She was, she was the, one of the producers at Radio Steady Go, the, the person who booked the artists. And so we become great friends. And then she, she was a great friend of Dustin Springfield, who she booked often for Radio Steady Go. And she called me one day and said, Dustin just come back from Italy. And she's heard this wonderful Italian song um, which she heard at the San Remo Festival, and she wants to sing it in English. She asked me, where should she get lyrics done? And Vicky said, do you know where she could get lyrics done for it? And I said, well, why don't we do them? And Vicky said, well, because we've never done lyrics before. I said, well, that doesn't stop me doing things. So uh, we took this little demo off to Vicky's flat one night. And, um, and we were a bit pissed off because we ate dinner every night and then went to the Ad Lib Club, which was the best disco in town. And writing the song went between dinner and the Ad Lib Club, we had to go and do some work. And normally we didn't do any work at that time of night. So we wanted to get it done in a hurry. And we put this demo on this scratchy acetate and this fantastic trumpet intro came up. You know? And I said to Vicky, you know, um, it's, it's a love song. We've got to write a love song. And Vicky was very unromantic. We were both unromantic. This is Swinging London. It was, Swinging London wasn't a romantic time, it was a shagging time. You, know, you, you went out every night to get sex, not to get romance. And, um, and so I said, we've got to write a love song. And she said, oh, oh, how awful a love song. I said, we have to listen, it's Italian. You know? And, um, and so we fiddled around with some words and we came up with this line, um, you don't love me. And I said, well, that's a, it's a bit accusatory, you don't love me, about how, how about I don't love you? And she said, that's even worse. And I said, well, how about you don't have to love me? And I said, oh, well, that's better. It doesn't quite fit. And, um, and then we fiddled around and if you don't have to say you love me, fit it. But people think that's a romantic line. But to be honest, that was a shagging line. When you went out at night and you sat there at three in the morning, pissed out of your head and you fancied somebody and you said, oh, let's go home and have sex. They said, oh, I can't go home. And, you know, you know I, I can't do all that. You know, we don't even know each other. And I said, oh, you don't have to say you love me. Just come and have a fuck, you know. And, um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't a romantic line at all. It was a pulling line. Can you remember, it was, a, 
Dusty took it and turned it into this amazing thing. Oh God, she was amazing, absolutely amazing. Can you remember a period where you knew you were gay, but you didn't tell anyone, and the feelings that sort of came with that uh, almost denial as it is, you know, as, as people have. Oh, that was a difficult one because I, I don't know, you first you wouldn't know you were gay. And I went to public school where a lot of boys had sex with each other and I enjoyed doing that very much. And, but that didn't really seem to be, I didn't know the word gay. I mean, I, I learned a bit by the word homosexual. And just at that time, there was a big scandal in the papers. It was the, uh, it, was, it was the scandal of Peter Wildblood and, and uh, Lord Montague. And so there's a lot of things in the papers about homosexuality. So we were reading about that. I thought, oh, I suppose that's what we are. Um, but I had sex a lot at school with a lot of boys. And when I left school, I was puzzled to see that all the boys I'd had sex with, and we thoroughly enjoyed having sex, you know, we did it in the woods or the back of the classroom or any way we could. Um, they all went off with girls. And it never occurred to me they liked girls. I thought, oh, they've left school, they have to join the adult world, they have to do what parents tell them to do. How boring, now they've got to go with girls and pretend they like girls. I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna go on doing what I do. It took me a long time to realize they did actually like girls. That doing it with other guys at school was just a, a teenage thing. They actually like girls. I thought, well, that's a bit strange, I don't. Um, so I just went on doing what I was doing. So I, I was both cautious, it's against the law um, and open. I mean, it, you know, no one comes out to that. They come out in bits and pieces. You, you, uh, you see someone you know is the same as you. So you say, well, I'm like that. At least so am I. So you've come out to him, but you haven't come out to anyone else. And as you realize you're gay, or it wasn't realizing I was gay. It was realizing there was a gay society, which you could mix in. Um, in that society, you could be out. How could you not be? You go to a gay pub, everyone's gay. You can't say, I'm not, you know. You won't get off with anybody if you do that. Let's just tell them straight out, I am and I'd like some. Um, so, you know, you come out bit by bit. And I was always anxious to be as open as possible about it. And I was in middle class, entertainment business, London. Those are three areas where you can be gay more easily than if you're working class, northerner, um, not in entertainment. Did you tell your and, parents? Well, I... I I was living with a guy for a year before I told them. I, I, every, I used to go to lunch with them every second Sunday. And every single second Sunday I went there and said, I'm going to tell them, I've got to tell them. And I just never could find the right moment. And finally, after, after two years, you know, I was living an openly gay life with other gay people, but my parents didn't know. And I got my father alone in the sitting room and, and my heart thumping terribly. I finally managed to say, you know, I, I've got to tell you, I'm gay, I'm, I'm homosexual, I like guys. And uh, there was a long pause, and he looked a bit surprised, shocked. I said, are you sure? And I, I got very, I lost my temper. I said, of course, I'm fucking sure. You know, I spent two years trying to get you in the room. I was like, what do you mean, am I sure? I'm telling you, I'm homosexual. And there's another long pause. And he said, oh, well, that's good. He said, I was afraid you were turning out a bit boring. <laughs> How fantastic. And, and the next day he took cigars to the office and said, let's celebrate. You know, my eldest son's gay, my younger son's straight. I've got a daughter. What a pity I don't have a second daughter. She could be a lesbian. I'd have a clean sweep. You know? So he was fantastic. Very not supportive, just didn't care. He didn't say how wonderful you're gay, really, in the office that day. But um, just he couldn't care less. I mean, that's just who I am and what I was. And didn't make a difference to him. And of course, you know, you're in, in the entertainment. He's passionate about music. Half the people, entertainers, actors, musicians. No, managers, managers. In the 60s, you had Brian Epstein, didn't you? The, uh, well, I mean, that, that's another thing that, you know, we began to see. I mean, if you were gay, you began to search around for something you could do where you didn't have to hide your life from everybody. I mean, you weren't going to go to get a job as a garage mechanic, probably. Um, and, you know, you, you looked at it and you said, where is there an area? Well, it was theatre, civil service, everyone knew had a lot of gay people, and the theatre... And hairdressing, and I didn't fancy hairdressing. I didn't really fancy the theatre. And um, but you looked around and you said, "Well, there is another possibility because everybody had heard about Larry Palms, who had managed um, quite a few acts in the late fifties. People like Tommy Steele and Cliff Richard for a while, and, and um, he, he gave all he gave he found these working class kids and gave them tough names like, like Steele and Anger and things like that, uh, and and um, and had a stable on them, had a household of them. And it was sort of 
known. He was gay. I mean, Peter Sellers made a very funny comedy record about you know, his, his uh, you know, pretending to be a, a, a reporter going to his house and interviewing him and all his boys were around. You know. It was, uh, I think, George Martin produced that. It's a comedy record, very good. And that's when I was still at school. So we'd all heard of Larry Parnes. And as we began to search around, or me and my gay friends who were well-educated and Londoners, we, we saw that if Larry Parnes could do it, perhaps there's another opening. And then Brian Epstein came along, who was almost a twin for Larry Parnes. I mean, he was a shop owner, he was provincial, he was gay, he was middle class, he was Jewish. It was almost a duplicate Larry Parnes. He thought, well, here's a second one, and it's even bigger because it's the Beatles. And then for a period, um, it seemed to, to be that most of the managers were gay, and there's good reason. It's because all gay people are subversive, and we've all, all been brought up in straight families, so we know how to play the game both ways. And, you know, most gay people will laugh at homophobic jokes, providing they're funny jokes, because, you know, inside us, we're all so straight. You know, we were culturally, bi we're bicultural. And um, so gay people are very good at, at sitting in the middle between two things. And, you know, artists were beginning to find that what had been recording artists in the 50s were just people who weren't paid a royalty who came in to sing a song, which was a hit song. Now artists were came into people who were the key thing. And song wasn't the thing, it was the artist. They began to get some power. And they began to get, like artists do, difficult, moody, and I won't do this, I don't want to do that. And record companies had never dealt with people like that before, because previously it was the song which was all important. And they found it difficult. And then along came these managers who sat in the middle, who understood the, the middle class, you know, um, commercial values the record company wanted. They also understood the, the artist and the teenage angst. And they were very, very good at playing that middle ground. As were Jewish kids, because they probably too at school had had to play a bit of a double game in order not to get beaten up. So nearly all the managers were Jewish or gay or both. And, uh, and people say, why, do, why have there been so few black managers? And it, people, a lot of think it's a prejudice against black people, but it's not. It's because they never had to play that double game because they couldn't play the double game. So young black kids are, are obvious. You know, they didn't play that double thing. I'm not really black. You can't. And so they didn't have that ability to sit in the middle in the same way. Um, and it's probably that's gone now. The artists coming into the business now understand the business, they've read about it, they've had 50 years of learning in magazines and media all about how the business works. But in those days, the artists didn't really understand it or know it, and they needed someone to, to bring them, bring the two sides together. When, and gay when, managers. Also. When did you realise that the music business was a business, personally? Uh, oh, before I went into it. Um, I, I, w before I even went to America as a musician when I was 18, I, I worked in I got a job as the band boy for Johnny Dankworth's band. Johnny Dankworth was a big band, the equivalent of a rock group now. They had these coach loads of musicians who drove around England to 25 musicians who were big bands. There were about half a dozen of them. Big, big names. I mean, these were the big audience pulling musicians at the time. And they played sort of, you know, the sort of Count Basie, Duke Ellington type of music we all know. Um, and I got a job as the band boy, as the guy who unloaded the equipment and set it up and carried the drums up the stairs at Thladden the Doe Empire or something like that. And, um, and I found that what really fascinated me, I loved the music and I loved the big band and I loved big band jazz, but what fascinated me was the talk in the band bus. I liked the talk. I liked, everyone had, some were passionately into jazz and nothing else. Others were talking about business deals. And others were talking about writing songs and getting a deal and getting a hit song. And I became, I liked the gossip of the business. So I sort of knew that even before I went off to be a musician in America. And so when I came back and then worked with Burt Packrack and then found myself mixing with all these music business people in the, in the trendy clubs, um, I, I knew I liked it. It was because it was both business, which is fun, and, um, and some alluringly um, non-mainstream. You see, the, the music business has always had this underlying criminality about it. I mean, in, 19, in 1918, radio started. It was illegal to have advertising on the radio. It was decided that to persuade someone to play your song was effectively advertising. And so uh, that's how payola developed. It was illegal to pay somebody uh, to play a song. And the only way you could get a song played, of course, is to pay somebody. You gave the producer 50 quid or $10 or whatever it was in those days. And so there was this underlying feeling of criminality which always ran through the music, and still does today. I mean, you know, in the last decade, 
all the major companies, Sony and Warner and Universal, have all been fined for payola. It just is so common now, it doesn't even get mentioned. You know? Oh, Sony last week paid a $10 million fine for payola. It just isn't hardly seen in the newspaper. Um, and that was good because it wasn't criminality like, you know, drug trafficking or children trafficking. It was just something a bit naughty, you know, and, and that sort of element of, it's like breaking rules at school. School rules are all stupid, you know, can't talk in the classroom, mustn't run in the passage. Another school says you've got to run in the passage. I mean, they're all dumb rules. And we break them because it's fun breaking them and because they're stupid, because adults are stupid, they make all these silly rules. And the music business felt like that too, just sort of naughtiness about it. Um, so it, it was a very good business to go in as a young person, especially a gay young person who, who, who already thought the law was a bit stupid. You, you managed, I mean, numerous bands, but Yardbirds, Cream, Ultravox, Boney M. And of course, with a connection to the George Michael documentary, Portrait of an Artist, um, you also got to manage Wham! How did that come about? Oh, well, I was sitting at home one night, having finished managing Japan, who I'd taken from being nothing in five years to being probably the biggest group in the UK, just 1981, 82, when they really happened. And then they broke up. And I thought, this is a stupid way to earn a living. You spend five years achieving everything you want to achieve and everything the band wants to achieve, and then they break up. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I sort of fallen in love with Asia going on and off over the last previous 10 years. And I decided I'm going to go and live in Asia and write books. I'd always intended I ought to write books. Um, and I was about to do that. And there was a ring on the door one day and I went and asked the door. And it was a chap called Jazz Summers, who I'd never met before, um, who said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm back, coming, I'm coming uninvited. But um, a friend of ours, Neil Warnock, suggested I, I ring, come and see him and talk. And um, I wanted to go into partnership. I said, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm a manager, you know, I, I manage Roots. And he had just finished with a group who'd had a couple of hits called Blue Zoo and they'd broken up. And he said, um, I want to be the biggest manager there is and, and uh, I can't do it by myself. I need your name, I need your background. And um, I said, no, I don't want to do it. I'm going abroad. And, and, and he wasn't at all like me. He was very straight. He talked with a very down market accent and deliberately. You could tell he wasn't even, you know, he was, he, he liked to talk with a rough accent. And, um, and I thought, well, I'd better be polite. So we went off to lunch around the corner. There was a Chinese restaurant and it turned out he could speak Cantonese. So that immediately, I began to look at him a bit strangely. <laughs> turned out later his father was gay too. So I mean, there's a lot of things I learned bit by bit. Um, but I sort of, he won me around and I said, well, I'll give it a go for a bit. And we wrote out a list of, we, we both agreed we didn't want to take a new band and start from the beginning. Because you can waste two or three years doing that. And then the band suddenly decide they don't want to do it or they find religion or girlfriends or something. Um, let's take a band which has already had a couple of hits thing, but hasn't broken in America and we'll make them the biggest in the world. So we wrote down this list and there was Culture Club and there was Eurythmics and a few others and Wham was on there. And um, as we went through the list, I, I realized you couldn't take them because they had a manager. You couldn't take them because their manager was my best friend. Their lawyer was very tough. And then we got to Wham and they didn't have a manager. Their lawyer was managing them and, and didn't know anything about management because management and law is completely different things. And um, so we went off to see, or Jazz went off to see their publisher who he knew, uh, who was very close with them and persuade him that we were the right people. And we fixed a meeting for them to come, come and see us. And what was and, your impression um, of both of them when you met them then? Well, it was very interesting because what had sold me on them, and it sold jazz, but sold me enormously, was their first ever Top of the Pops. And they were amazing on Top of the Pops. They, they, they came across in a way I'd never seen a group come across before. They worked to the cameras as if they'd been rehearsed for a week. And Top of the Pops has no rehearsals. Just go down, sing a song, the camera shoot it. But they had obviously been there several weeks before, probably watching each week when it was being filmed, how it was done so that when they arrived, they'd already rehearsed to the cameras they knew would be there. So their performance looked like a totally rehearsed performance. It was really quite extraordinary. And I knew they must have done that. So that impressed me. And they came across as this fantastic image, you know, the two young guys around town with their girlfriends going to clubs and dancing, you know, a very young, youthful, fun, heterosexual image. Um, and then they came in the room and Andrew 
was just like the image on television. He came in, oh, a lovely pad man, you know, and he sat in my biggest armchair and put his feet on my coffee table without taking his shoes off first. Picked up a magazine and started looking through it, yawned. And George was nothing like that. That was the happy-go-lucky guy you saw in the video or on television. George was, uh, George was straight down to business. Who have you managed it for? Why do you think you can manage this? What are you going to do for us? You know? You're not going to look after our money. We're going to have to run accountant. We're going to have to have two accountants. I said, what do you want two accountants for? So one can keep an eye on the other. I mean, you know, this was, this was not the guy in the, in the image. And um, I thought, well, this is perfect. You know, you've got, you've got the great image, but actually behind it, you've got everything you need. You've got the person who thinks about business and the person who, who projects having a wonderful time. What did he want? To, what did he want career-wise? Was he very specific? They, they, we went and had dinner with them at the Bombay Brasserie, and uh, they, we hadn't got into the slattery, and uh, they fixed us with a steely glare and said, "We want to be the biggest group in the world, and you've got one year." I said, "Oh, come on, that's impossible. The biggest group in the world has to be the biggest group in America as well, because it's two thirds of the world market." And no one's ever broken America in under three years. Even the Beatles took three years. You can't do it in a year. They don't have national press. You can't get in the front page of the Daily Mail in America because the Daily Mail is a New York Times and it's an LA Times. And this, you, you can't, you know, you, only if you're on the front of Newsweek or, or something like that could you possibly spread yourself across the whole country. It's done by touring in a small way. You go to one town after another for 30 cities and then you go back the next year and tour in a slightly bigger venue. It takes two or three years. And they said, no, you've got a year. And uh, I think it was Jazz on the third or fourth or fifth bottle of wine that said, um, perhaps we can make you the first group ever playing communist China. And I thought, wow, I wanted to go and live in Asia. And Jazz did, wanted did to Did he really come out with that on, that on the spot and say that? Yeah, yeah, he just said that. And I immediately thought, I wanted to go to Asia before he came along. He wants to be a manager, which I don't really much care about. So I'll go to Asia and fix this. And he can stay behind and do all the work. And for the next 18 months, I went to China every single month and bit by bit by bit uh, pulled it off and got on there. And it, and it worked. I mean, the, the week before we finally played that gig in China, I'd, gone, I'd flown into Los Angeles and immigration and said, you know, what do you do? And I said, I manage a pop group. And they said, anyone famous? I said, yeah, they're Wham. I said, Who are Wham? <laughs> I said, well, they're actually number one at the moment with a song called Killer Swiss Swiss. I've never heard of it. And I said, well, I'll sing you a bit. Well, no, no, no. He said, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, they're called Wham, are they? That was the problem in America. DJs played songs without announcing them, and there was no national press, no national imagery to promote. The week after they played in China, they'd been on the CBS, NBC, ABC News, 24 hours, every hour on the app, 24 hours, seven days a week. They'd been on a couple of time, and they'd been on a couple of Newsweek. And I flew into L.A., and the immigration guy said, what do you do? I said, I manage Wham. And he said, wow, wow, amazing. Hey, guys, come over. You know, have you got any CDs or photographs or autographs you can give us? So it, it happened like that. And three months after we played China, we played a stadium tour, which normally takes three to four years. But it didn't do it a year, though. It was about 18 months. But I remember at the, at the last date of the stadium tour was the Los Angeles race course. And everyone who was everyone was in the audience. And, and Elton John came bounding into the dressing room, and went up to George, said, you bastard, you did it in a year and a half. It took me five years. So we, we felt good about that. I mean, obviously, the, you know, what you're saying is that the perception of them completely changed and that propelled their career. Did China change them personally? No, not in the slightest. Other than George, uh, I mean, George, George was, George didn't want to be Wham. Wham was his stepping stone. Wham was the moment when he realized he could get on stage and sing because Wham was originally dreamt up between them. It wasn't going to be George singing. George was going to write the songs and Andrew was going to find another person who'd be the singer and they couldn't find the right person. So eventually George said, oh, I'll have a go at it. But of course, once he was on stage, Andrew was a cover, you know, George. Well, with the first ever date of the first Wham tour, when Andrew walked out on stage, the entire audience screamed and the girls pulled their hair out. And when George walked on, they didn't even, not a sound. I mean, he was a bit podgy and he didn't have style. By the end of the tour, he had the blonde hair and he'd lost weight and he was the one they screamed at. He learned so quickly. And once he'd learned, he didn't need Wham anymore. And although he said to Andrew, we'll do it for three years and three albums, he was trying to get out a bit quicker. And after two albums, he decided, I can't do it anymore. It's time to go solo. 
So it was um, a stepping stone he really did need. I mean, the pop star story, very superficially, is, you know, a uh, young, cute boy becomes pop star, thinks they're going to get, that all their problems are going to be solved by fame, but actually they're compounded and it ends in tears. Um, what's different about George's story that attracted you to make a documentary? Nothing different. It ended in tears, didn't it? You know, it's exactly that. He started off exactly as you said. We've come to solve my problems. By the end of the Faith Tour, I wasn't managing it. Then after Wham, I didn't manage him. I couldn't have done it because I would have been so in opposition to the way he presented himself. The, ho the whole point to me of breaking up Wham was for him to say, right, now I'm going to be my real self. I don't want this pressure of pretending to be someone I'm not. Instead of which, he went on playing the same part he played in Wham, but without Andrew to support him. That's an enormous pressure. I mean, you know, he, he thought he could do it. He did do it. I mean, he thought he could do it. He did it, but it had a bad effect on him. And by the end of the Faith Tour, he was really, you know, absolutely didn't want to do this at all. Um, at that point, I don't think he even foresaw doing as much with his career as he subsequently did. I think he just really would, wanted to get out of it. Um, he was presenting somebody who wasn't himself. He was getting deeper and deeper into having to have a conflicting life of, not being gay when he knew he was. And you see, even after the Faith Tour, it took him years to actually come out properly. Um, and the longer you don't come out, the more difficult it gets. You know, it's, it's easy to blurt out when you're 18. Perhaps you wish you hadn't the next morning, but within a week, you're happy you did. But the longer you don't, and then you begin to look like you don't have any credibility. I mean, for a long time, George would say, you know, I wasn't really gay. It took me a long time to learn to side that's rubbish. He knew he was gay when he was 18. But the longer it went on, the more he, he knew he sort of misled people and he felt guilty about it. And, and to his credit, I mean, he really did something about it. I mean, he was a huge, huge support for young gay people who, who, who didn't want to have to go through the same, same thing. I mean, it's, because it's your perspective, the film, it has this gay sensibility to it, which makes it, for me also as a gay man, his story much more touchable and understandable. The and problem beautiful. with George is, yes, everyone who's made films about it, none of them take that sense. But they all talk about the gay side as something a bit sensational. You don't get into how it makes you, how different you are because of it. And I think George suffered, frankly, from having nobody gay in his entourage around him, no manager, uh, no relations, I mean, in the family. Um, he was surrounded by straight people always. And so his gay release was, was as we know, to be quite promiscuous, sexy, and go out and cruise. Uh, whereas if he'd been surrounded by at least a couple of people who were close to him in a business sense who were gay, I think it would have helped him um, develop in a better way. I mean, I'm not sure. It's just guessing. It might have been deliberate on his part that he didn't want gay people around. But he, I mean, he enjoyed... He enjoyed being a star. I and mean, if you enjoy being a star, it's, if you're gay and you enjoy being a star, then you're going to be more of a star with straight people. If you're out, if you're gay and you're out with straight people, you're going to be more of a star if you're gay and you're out with gay people. No competition. And you see George on chat shows. I mean, he was fantastic on Parkinson or MTV. And then he got into, you know, uh, Graham Norton. He was never good on Graham Norton because Graham was being gayer than him. And, and George didn't want to get sort of dragged into a, you know, a gay repartee because then he'd lose his, his edge about being an open gay person. So perhaps he chose to be surrounded by straight people. How did you decide on the people you really had to interview for this documentary? Well, um, there were a few I had to interview I couldn't get for one reason or another. Um, but I did feel we needed someone of the status of Stevie Wonder, uh, and then Stevie agrees, so that sort of solved that. And then Rufus Wainwright, who I thought we needed somebody who was not necessarily the most famous singer in the world, but the most respected and gay. You know, I, I was looking mainly at gay people. Terence Trent Darby, who, as you know, um, changed his name and doesn't like being called that anymore, or even reminded that he was that, um, I, I wasn't gay, but you know, he had a very uh, as a young person, he had a very bisexual personality. He knew how to project himself attractively to everybody. Um, so these were people who, who I knew would have a lot to say and understand him. And then the people who worked with him, 
So many of these documentaries, they just go for famous names. I mean, who wants to hear Liam Gallagher talk about Wham? You know he doesn't respect people like him. It just is sort of sickening to see it. Um, but, you know, the tour manager who tours with Ron, the security man who sits on next to him in the aeroplane for 25 years, because know him better than anybody else. Um, the producers who sat in the studio for four years, four solid years every day with him. Uh, these people knew him better and know him better uh, than an awful lot of people. I mean, it's like your own brother or sister. How well do they know you? I bet you have friends who know you better than your own brother or sister. It's, they don't spend that much time with you. They think they have a possession of you, but they don't necessarily know you as well as other people do. I mean, what I loved about it as well is the sort of psychological angle of really trying to understand the relationship with his father, the relationship George had to his sexuality, which we've always, you know, already talked about, and um, his relationship with drugs and why he ended up going on that path. Well, you know, uh, you can't tell everything in a film. Uh, you, I mean, you can in a five-part series, but, you know, I, I just wanted to get it into 90 minutes. Um, his father, look, his father, I don't think his father was ever anti-gay or homophobic. He runs a restaurant. How do you run a restaurant? Well, you know, if you're anti-gay and half your waiters are going to be gay and you like them and they work well for you. But that wasn't what he wanted for his son. So his father was disappointed with his son because he just wanted someone to come and run the family restaurant. But, you know, he was pretty proud of his son pretty quickly once he saw what was happening. Um, Drugs is another matter because, you know, um, when I knew George, he was, he was prim. I mean, he would, you know, he would, even if you smoked a joint, he would sort of be quite rude to you and say, you know, this isn't the way to behave. You know, you've got to, we have to discipline ourselves and control ourselves. And, and that slipped away, I guess, as he got more and more frustrated and, um, and confused about denying his sexuality when he, you know, he always wanted to be open. There was an interview while I was still managing. He did when he was still in Wham with uh, um, I forgot who no, Julie Birchall it was, and um, he was trying to he was trying to come out. He was dancing around in a sarong and being camp, and, and uh, Julie didn't pick up on it. But he sort of wanted someone to say you're gay. He was going to restaurants all the time, you know, kissing the head waiter. And he used to go to Bolts, which is a gay club in North London. He can go on their Saturday trip to Brighton on the bus. He was trying to out himself without saying I'm gay. But everyone um, knew he was gay. I mean, I used to, everyone well, no, in, they that didn't. Scene, in that you're scene, in that scene. You're gay. No, I you're okay. gay. But I used, uh, to go, you. I used to go to Bolts on a, you know, all the time. Yeah. And George Michael was always there. And everyone knew that there, there he was, was a gay. Sort of, there was still in the 80s, there was still a sort of pact in the press. They didn't out you, that they didn't speak badly of you. It lasted up to about the Elton Sun thing. Um, people said, did George have gay fans? George's fans, apart from girls, were largely gay guys who were afraid to come out. They sensed in him someone who was exactly like them and that he became their mentor. Let's watch him, what he does, you know. Uh, out gay guys were not very keen on George because why wasn't he out? But gay guys who were not out were very keen on him. And I think, you know, a large, large part of his audience was young gay guys or guys who were slightly confused about the sexuality or had some other aspect of them which they kept under wraps, wish they didn't have to. Um, people see, people, the public are very, are very perceptive about who and what you are. What they can really, see that. What's really fascinating about it is the, also the look into the music and the lyrics and uh, what they meant and how they reflected on his life. What's, was there anything that surprised you in the journey of making this documentary? No, no, no. I mean, one or two lyrics I'd never really heard. It, it, when he wrote Freedom, I don't mean Freedom 90, which is the title of his new film. When he wrote Freedom, the song they had with hit, uh, with Wham, they hit the head with Wham, which is when I was managing him. I never really read the lyrics, but in the lyrics, you know, he said, I'm in the closet and I threw away the key. Now, you're talking about whether he knew he was gay. How do you write a lyric like that without knowing you're gay? That's what it's about, isn't it? So, you know, there were, there were more than clues. There was an outright statement right there. Um, and he still took all that time to come to terms with himself. But I can understand why. I mean, I, I never pressured him to come out. And I, it seemed to me 
every good reason not to come out. He, he was part of a group which had a very heterosexual image. It was like Starsky and Hutch and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, a very attractive Hollywood two guys image. He knew it was going to end because Wham was going to have a definite life of two or three years. Why not stay? If you feel more comfortable in the closet, stay in the closet till you finish Wham, you know? And if you'd like to come out, come out. I mean, I, I wouldn't advise him either way, but I wouldn't say you've got to come out. But when Wham finished, I thought that was the moment he should come out and he didn't. And then that became, that's when life got difficult for him when he stayed in after that. And then by the time Wham finished, you had AIDS. Uh, but sorry, by the time, when, when he didn't come out at the end of Wham, by the time Faith finished and the Faith tour, which is two years, you had AIDS. And then you're really in a difficult position because you have all these hundreds of thousands, millions of teenagers rushing around trying to touch you and be part of your life. When touching is, or the desire to touch is an essential part of pop teenage imagery. And now, if you say you've got AIDS, everyone thinks if they touch you, they're going to get it and die. I mean, it was not an easy thing to come out. If you're out already, you had to live with that to sort of way, find a way to deal with it. But if you weren't out already, that was an extra pressure just to keep it under wraps for a bit longer. And um, without any question, you know, AIDS was a huge pressure on him. He, did, he really didn't know. And nor would I, I'm glad I wasn't managing that because it, I wouldn't have known what to advise. I would have said for your own mental health, you need to come out, but for your career, probably not. And your career is part of your mental health. I mean, to destroy your career is not gonna help your mental health anyway. So there was an extremely difficult position there. I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube the other day and found a Bowie interview with Parkinson. And I'm going to read this because I just found it really fascinating. He said that people in show business are dysfunctional and in denial about what they are and that those who crave affection are sometimes very bad in giving it. So are stars doomed to have a tragic life in order to enrich our lives? I don't think they're that uh, generous. Um, they usually suffer some sort of lack of love trauma in childhood. 99% of all people who are stars, even ones you meet who think they didn't, no, I'm wrong, this one didn't, this guy's an ordinary guy. Sure enough, you get to know them, you find what drove them to want to be on stage in the performing arts was a lack of love at a crucial point in their age. And, um, and so, they want that love from wherever they can get it. And they feel that the mass of people loving them will make up for that empty hole inside them. And the only thing ever which you see gets them out of that is when they meet someone and have a real genuine loving relationship and change into a, a father and a husband. Um, and then sometimes they sort of kill themselves. And usually after that, they're not so creative and perform less well. But mostly they don't. Mostly they are sort of stuck in this bubble. I mean, George hated the excess of publicity at the end of the Faith Tour, but you know, he still loved it. I mean, it's one of the things I points I make in the film that fame is the most addictive drug there ever is. If if you're addicted to it, I mean, I've never been addicted. I hate fame. I go into a restaurant and it's lovely when you phone up and they give you the best table. But when people come around and ask for your autograph, you hate it. I, mean, I don't want to have dinner. I'm, I'm sitting with Steve. I'm my friend. I want to talk. I don't want to have people coming around. But the artist still likes it even there. They may complain, but they like it. That's why they're there. You know, why do you go into, for years I went to the Caprice and always in the same seat in the Caprice, always with Roger Moore. That's where Roger Moore, that was his seat. Well, he sat there so people would come straight in and say, oh, Roger Moore says tonight. I love Roger Moore, you know. Um, if he really wanted to be discreet and didn't want that, he'd change his seat every night. It's, you know, the artists like being loved by a huge mass of people rather than, than one person. Presumably that is reciprocal. They'd rather give a, if you spread your love over a million people, you don't have to give too much to each one. If you're giving it all to one, that's rather a lot. How much do you think we, and I would say the wider we, because we read the press and the press were involved in his downfall. Because towards the, the last few years of George's life, um, it was one tragic incident after another. And it's, it's a little bit like, you know, the Amy Winehouse story as well. You're almost sort of waiting for the end. You know, you're sort of expecting the end to happen. And, and there's this fascination as well as 
horror that you're you know having for that person and those feelings you're having for the person but the press the industry are they are they almost feeding off the insecurities of the artist i don't think the press are as calculating as you think they are they they get a lot of stick for, for doing what you just said um because the way his life ended i mean i don't mean where he died. I mean, the last three, four, five years or so, it's not very different from, say, Prince, or, or in some ways Bowie. If you know more about Bowie than, than most of got out, and even Lennon, um, was he walking around waiting to be shot? Probably. I mean, it, 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 they're sort of, you sort of know that their their mental health has always been heading in that direction. Um, and they don't want to be cured because, you know, it, as a manager, you, you're often faced with a situation where you have an artist whose mental health is declining and his mental, his bad mental, bad mental health is, is the fuel for creativity. You know, you say, all right, let's stop working, let's go to a psychiatrist and let's get you better. Well, that's the end of his career. And they know that too. They know. I mean, an artist hasn't written a song for a long time. He's got to find some new material. He'll delve back into his brain. He'll go back to bad experiences. Most of us have a great ability to put bad experiences behind us uh, so they're not even bad anymore. You know how you usually remember good times and not bad times. And to go back into your mind and to literally dig down and think of a bad experience and welter in it, you know, to put yourself a wash in it. Uh, anyone who's done it a little bit knows it's not healthy. And artists do it deliberately to try and dig up something creative to create a new work of art. Um, so they, to have to be cured would be like having that library taken away from them. You mentioned uh, the other documentary that's out. There's a book that's out as well. Um, how do you feel the legacy of George Michael is changing now after his death? I, I, I don't think I can answer that, Chris. I, I, I really don't think it does change. I think most of the fans he had are still fans. I don't think he's creating a new audience. So that might come later, but I doubt it right now. Um, and I, I don't think I mean, a, a legacy is usually just mus musical. It can't be anything else in the end. You know, you can read about him, but you know, what he, what he created and did, which is really good, for instance, for the gay community in the last, 10 years of his life uh, wouldn't be relevant to today because most of what was achieved by what he did is now set in stone. I mean, we, we don't worry about being gay. We don't even think about it being a negative particularly. Uh, we might even in many cases now think it's a positive. And you see it even in the last few years in America. I mean, you know, you had the first ever gay candidate for president four years ago and people said, can he overcome this barrier of being the only gay candidate? I would have thought in the next presidential, this will be a, a benefit that people will say, well, we, you know, he's, we don't care if he's gay. And this means he has, a, has an insight into life which we don't have. Suddenly it's switched. So I don't think his legacy will be anything but his music. And how much his music stands up is difficult to know. He would hate it, but the song most likely to stay there forever is Last Christmas, uh, because it, it has that timeless, and, uh, years and years and years go by and I hear it yet again at Christmas time, and it's the best Christmas song ever for me. It has a, it's both, hurtful and angst-ridden and totally joyous. You know, it's a fabulous song. Careless Whisper, um, those are the great songs. And the more commercial, the greater. And he would probably prefer that he was remembered for the more esoteric songs. Well, before I end, because I want to ask you some questions about what's coming up for you, but I just want to say again, uh, I was so moved. I cried three times. <laughs> I, I was so touched and I really was surprised in the sense of this journey that you took me on with that documentary, which was wonderful in lots of ways and also incredibly revealing, as I said at the beginning. So um, thank you for that. And I want to get on to what's coming up for you? Because you mentioned at the beginning that you have a book coming out, which is called Sour Mouth, Sweet Bottom, and it's stories from your life. From your life. What, what have you learned about yourself by writing the story of, of your life? <laughs> um, 
not to do what I just talked about artists doing in order to dig up material. I didn't much enjoy writing it because, you know, to, to, you'd think back as, oh, I've got to put another, you know, it's vignettes, it's, it's 60 vignettes from my life, like snaps. So the way I described it was I shook the photo album and these are the snaps which fell out on the floor. Um, I could have done 60 different ones. I might do it again. But you go back, you think of a good story, you go back and you try to relive it and think how you were at the time. And it's not always enjoyable. I mean, mostly we, as life progresses, we mostly get happier. I mean, apart from the fact we might have an illness or something, we deal with problems better. So to go back isn't always happy. On the other hand, there are good stories. I wanted to tell them. And, and I should have sent you a copy before the interview so you could read it, but sorry, I didn't. Um, and um, in general, when you go back inside yourself and relive those, I, mean, I, I remember Mick Jagger, uh, he got a million pound advance when that was still a lot of money. I mean, that was 20 years ago to write his biography, autobiography. And after six months, he sent it back. And he said, I'm not enjoying it. And I understand that. You don't really enjoy it. And um, so most writers who write about themselves are doing the same as the songwriter who writes, who digs in into his brain to find things he can write about. They're not always enjoyable. And it's not enjoyable feeling. I mean, as much as we'd all love to be young, you wouldn't really want to live through the bad things in your childhood again. But you can't write about them without living through them. So it's not always enjoyable. One of the things that always impresses me about you is the fact that you have so much going on and so much energy into, into what you're doing. You're working on uh, new documentaries, music consultancy, a little bit of management, production, songwriting, and, uh, you know, this four, not one, but four new film projects. Well, so the, the, main thing, the main thing I've done through COVID actually was none of those. Well, it was music. Um, I co-wrote and executive produced a rock album, which was fantastic because um, this is probably, I mean, it's as good a rock album as ever been made. The fact is it's not gonna be huge hits is because um, you can't, it's classic rock and, and you can't make classic rock now and sell it unless you are one of the classic rock bands who are known. But it's a super group. I put together a group of musicians who are the three number one Netherlands musician, guitar, drums and bass, and, um, and tour status quo, and Paul Hirsch, who was Chris Rea's pianist. And um, we made this incredible album and I co-wrote it and um, it's out now. In fact, it's just coming out to be promoted in the UK right now. And um, it, it was the most satisfying thing musically I've ever done. Although I wasn't really doing it for money. I mean, normally in the music business, you're forced into having to do stuff for money. Um, the, the group's called Amsterdam Rock Exchange. You can go on Spotify and hear it. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastically good rock album. Um, and I, I wrote lyrics and I, I found that was very enjoyable because I found, I thought it'd be very difficult to write lyrics. Um, what I was trying to do was create a, an album of songs, which, um, you know, most of the people who listen to rock music and love rock music or in rock groups are going to be over 50. And when you listen to the new Rolling Stones song or whatever old groups are writing new songs, they're still writing hey, baby, I met you at the bus stop and you look so cute. And you know, fuck, you know, you know, why aren't you really saying, I was writing songs about, you know, let's see the lawyer, let's sort out the divorce. Where are the kids going to live? You know, can I use some of the money to buy a sports car? Um, I was trying to write lyrics for, for middle-aged, late middle-aged people. Um, and listening back now, I mean, is, they're very good. And I, I compliment myself, but they are. I mean, usually I don't compliment myself. And um, it's a very good album. So in many ways, that's the most satisfying of all the things you're talking about. Not the most, making the most money, but that doesn't matter. I mean, you're an incredibly driven person, but you didn't have a fucked up childhood. How come? Well, I'm not driven at all. <laughs> you got oh, that wrong. Well, I mean, come on. My, I mean, my, 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 my earliest worry was how undriven I was. Oh, I'd yes. have to get on my bicycle and go riding all day and see what was going on in the world. Um, I had no motivation. I've never in my life been motivated to do anything. And I worried about how I was going, you know, I, you know, I like comfortable, I like good clothes and nice hotels and getting on a plane, better to fly first class and cycle on a bike to Oxford. Um, but how was I going to get that? Because I have no motivation. I and mean, if it comes down to it, so do you want to get a job and work and build yourself up and be top of a bank or something? No. So I attached myself to people who are highly motivated and most aspiring rock musicians are highly motivated because they need to be, because they're desperate for that love they didn't get as a child. And it's not very difficult because I'm 
reasonably clever and objective. And so they'd come to me and say, I, I, I want to be a rock star, what do I do? And I'd say, well, let's choose a great song and get your voice a bit better and do this and do that. It seemed to me like pretty obvious things to answer. And they would say, marvelous, Al, you're just the man I wanted as, as a manager. And then I have a very strong sense of commitment to my good middle class upbringing. Uh, so if you say you'll do something, you sign an agreement, you, you then have to do it. And so and I enjoy getting involved with these people because they give me the motivation I don't really have, at least for the period of that project. Um, so that's sort of what I do. I spent my life finding things which hook me, get me into working with somebody else who's got the motivation and then I fulfill what they want. And I, nothing I like better than finishing. I mean, like when I stopped managing Wham! I'm, when George decided he didn't want Jazz and I to go on managing him, Jazz was distraught and his life was managing Wham! And I was thrilled. <laughs> Thank God for that. To where I can wake up and I don't have to care about somebody else's life, you know. Uh, I'd like to do it again later, but now I get a nice years off, year off. You know? um, I don't, I don't, I'm not motivated. I just get myself into situations where I have to fulfill an obligation. And uh, signing a contract is always an obligation. Well, Saying I love you is an obligation. You're screwed, aren't you? I love you, or show me, you know. Oh, now you've got a good obligation to sort out. I think on that note, that's probably the place where we should end. But I want to say <laughs> thank you again, and thank you um, for your output, because um, this George Michael Portrait of an Artist is now on Amazon and Apple. Um, and as I said, it's a wonderful documentary and a brilliant piece of work. So Simon Napier-Bell, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>